Well, it's my rather privilege or punishment to, to open the proceedings, and I just want to say I'm going to try and take what I wrote and timed at 50 minutes and deliver it in 25. Um, well, hence the stopwatch, which keeps on dark, so I'll lose track of time. So if someone sees me going past 25 minutes, wave at me or something. Uh, I want to leave at least a few minutes to discuss um, anything that comes up at the end and uh, you know, talk about the poem in particular. Really, the, this has become a kind of um, process of taking what was originally a paper, tearing it up, taking bits of it, but making it mostly be about a kind of close reading of this poem um, by Marianne Moore. Marianne Moore is, um, I think, is possibly, for me anyway, the kind of Ur poet of the 20th century. Um, not T.S. Eliot, not Ezra Pound fighting in the captain's tower, but Marianne Moore. The reason she's not recognized as such, I think, are, are, are at least twofold, or maybe threefold. The first one, of course, obviously, is because she's a woman. And women modernist poets were supposed to be eccentric or else they didn't get to survive at all, but they certainly they didn't get to be the, the kind of, you know, head honcho type figure. And secondly, because she was a Presbyterian. And there's a worldwide conspiracy against Presbyterians. You may not know this. But um, there's a, a, a feeling that since Presbyterians have promised themselves so much in the afterlife, they shouldn't get any particular honors here while they're on earth. So being a devout Presbyterian, Marian Moore was somewhat overlooked by, by the establishment for a while. But interestingly, while Ezra Pound was stomping around Europe saying the trick is to break the pentameter and all this kind of stuff, Marianne Moore was just sitting quietly at home doing it. She lived with her mother, and she and her mother had discussed these poems at great depth. And Marianne Moore was inventing new forms, new poetic structures, which are just as interesting and formally rewarding as the old received, as it were, European forms. So, if nothing else, I hope some people may, may not know her work. If nothing else from this morning's session, um, I hope you take away a poem that you'll hopefully love. Um, I want to read it through for us because, first, it's just a joy to read. It's the Steeplejack. Dürer would have seen a reason for living in a town like this, with eight stranded whales to look at, with the sweet sea air coming into your house on a fine day, from water etched with waves as formal as the scales on a fish. One by one, in twos and threes, the seagulls keep flying back and forth over the town clock, or sailing around the lighthouse without moving their wings rising steadily with a slight quiver of the body, or flock mewing where a sea, the purple of the peacock's neck, is paled to greenish azure as Dürer changed the pine green of the Tyrol to peacock blue and guinea gray. You can see a 25-pound lobster and fish nets arranged to dry. The whirlwind fife and drum of the storm bends the salt marsh grass, disturbs stars in the sky and the star on the steeple. It is a privilege to see so much confusion. The skies, by what might seem the opposite, the seaside flowers and trees are favored by the fog so that you have the tropics at first hand. The trumpet vine, foxglove, giant snapdragon, a salpiglossus that has spots and stripes, morning glories, gourds, or moon vines trained on fishing twine at the back door, cattails, flags, blueberries and spiderwood, striped grass, lichens, sunflowers, asters, daisies, yellow and crab claw ragged sailors with green bracts, toad plant, petunias, ferns, pink lilies, blue ones, Tigers, poppies, black sweet peas. The climate is not right for the banyan, frangipani, or jackfruit trees. 
or for exotic serpent life. Ring lizard and snake skin for the fruit if you see fit, but here they've cats, not cobras, to keep down the rats. A diffident little newt with white pin dots on black horizontal spaced out bands lives here, yet there is nothing that ambition can buy or take away. The college student named Ambrose sits on the hillside with his not native books and hat and sees boats at sea progress white and rigid as if in a groove. Liking an elegance of which the source is not bravado, he knows by heart the antique sugar bowl shaped summer house of interlacing slats and the pitch of the church spire, not true, from which a man in scarlet lets down a rope as a spider spins a thread. He might be part of a novel, but on the sidewalk a sign says, C.J. Poole, Steeplejack, in black and white, and one in red and white says, Danger. Church portico has four fluted columns, each a single piece of stone made modester by whitewash. This would be a fit haven for waifs, children, animals, prisoners, and presidents who have repaid sin-driven senators by not thinking about them. The place is a schoolhouse, a post office in a store, fish houses, hen houses, a three-masted schooner on the stocks. The hero, the student, the steeplejack, each in his way is at home. It could not be dangerous to be living in a town like this of simple people who have a steeplejack placing danger signs by the church while he is gilding the solid pointed star, which on the steeple stands for hope. The, the title of this, this discussion is um, The Power of the Visible is the Invisible, which is a quotation from another poem of Marianne Moore. He did just with hard iron. Um, and I was interested in um, the fact that we constantly find meaning in, in the visible by inferring or imposing or interpreting in various ways in such a way that we can find the invisible in it, which is the beginning point of this discussion for me. It's no accident the name Jura is the first word of Marianne Moore's great poem, The Steeplejack, one of the landmark works of modernist writing. For one thing, Dürer suggests a mental climate in which certain values, perspective, attention to the real world, rather than the variety of self-deception that Maurice Blanchot calls l'imaginaire, and the valuing of the phenomena of the world for their own sake are fundamental. While sidestepping mere literalism, and both too early and too spiritually alert to succumb to reductionism, Dürer was a realist of the best kind, a man who wanted to experience and to depict the world as it is, not as he or his church or some artistic fad would prefer it to be. Of course, he would have enjoyed living in a place that has eight stranded whales to look at with the sweet sea air coming in on a fine day, with water etched with waves as formed with the scales on a fish just as he would have noticed and approved the way in which the local builders had learned from their surroundings when constructing the antique sugar bowl-shaped summer house of interlacing slats. And this is something Moore does all the way through the poem, is to show echoes of the constructed world and the natural world. And the poem itself echoes this as well, and its structure. I, don't want, I haven't got time to go into the form of it, but if you look at the form, you'll see there's a very clear structure there which repeats in a similar irregular way, if you like, almost like a wave structure. And, and this is the, a key point of the poem. Everything that's, in, everything that's right about this panoramic view of this town is because it's right because it's based on observation of nature, of, of the, what's really there in the world, not in position of order, of, of human order. The human made echoes the form of the sea, the fish scales are echoed in the waves, the waves are echoed in the sugar bowl summer, summer house. We know from Dewar's diaries that he would go a long way to observe natural phenomena, and in fact that the old, you know, the old myth that he died because of that, um, it still persists. This is from his diary of, of 1520, 
November 22nd to December the 3rd, um, at Zürichsee in Zeeland, a whale has been stranded by a high tide in a gale of wind. It is much more than 100 fathoms long, and no man living in Zeeland has seen one even a third as long as this is. The fish, that's the whale, cannot get off the land. The people would gladly see it gone as they fear the great stink, for it is so large that they say it could not be cut in pieces and the blubber boiled down in half a year. Some days later, he continues, on December 9th, Early on Monday, we started again by ship and went by the Vera and Zürichsee and tried to get sight of the great fish, but the tide had carried him off again. In T. Sturge Moore's biography of Dürer from 1905, after quoting these passages, he noted that the object of the whole exposition was doubtless that Dürer might see and sketch the whale. And he repeats the well-known story of Dürer's near death while at whale watching. But he continues, in the Netherlands, Dürer's curiosity to see a whale nearly resulted in his own shipwreck and indirectly produced a malady which finally killed him. But Dürer's curiosity was really most scientific where it was most artistic. In his portraits, in his studies of plants and birds, and the noses of stags, or the slumber of lions. And I want, if you could bear that in mind, that idea that's most scientific when most artistic, I think it applies also to Marianne Moore. Moore's strategy in the poem by beginning with this, one, this word, Dürer, depends on the reader's knowing a fair amount about Dürer as an artist and as an individual, but she doesn't hesitate to assume that knowledge. Much could be said about this assumption with regard to more recent arguments about elitism, but I find it heartening that rather than lament the apparent loss of a world culture, as some other poets do, for example, Eliot with his, his fragments, etc., or Mandelstam in Russia saying, talking about acmeism as nostalgia for a world culture. Marianne Moore doesn't succumb to this kind of pessimism. She just gets, again, she just gets on with it. Um, she seems to trust in the power of a culture to exist in its own right, separate from any social class or elite group. This arises from a fundamental conviction that a recognition of Dürer's values is not based on education or class background, but on an innate moral character or aesthetic moral character. This may seem like a red herring at the moment, but let's bear in mind, hopefully I'll get to that part later on as well. What I do want to emphasize, however, is that by beginning the poem with the artist's name, Moore is invoking Dürer's determination to see the world as it is, rather than as we are told it must be, to see that is for himself and not simply to accept the authority of contemporary experts or churchmen or those systematic philosophers who gladly bend the given world to their theories of what is real. It's the same impulse that informs the move that happens in the 16th century, this is arguable I know, when painters no longer expend their energies on religious works and apply themselves to the reflective surfaces of an oyster shell or the skin of a lemon or Sorry, the poetic foreigners of much of this, in fact, is Dürer's own, the, the large turf. If you remember that painting, there was a sketch, it's a study for a larger painting, of the piece of turf that he has brought into his studio and then, and then um, paints in great detail, which he painted in Nuremberg in 1503, whose attention to detail, hound's tongue and yarrow. That's just a few. This realism, this specificity, is continued in the work of the still life painters as they reproduce the blemish on a fallen plum as carefully as the striation of the at that time exotic and glamorous Turk's cap tulip. When I say that this painting moves away from the literal religious tradition, I do not mean to suggest that it's not religious, only that it shifts the focus somewhat towards the observation of nature and natural law. And I don't have time here, I know, to talk about Dürer's relationship to the work of Albertus Magnus. But um, there's, 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 there are clear lines to be drawn that um, Dürer was influenced by Albertus Magnus' thought. Um, and, and I take for one little tag to give myself some authority, to, referring back to Jacob's talk yesterday, from Albertus Magnus, 
The aim of natural philosophy is not simply to accept the statements of others, but to investigate the causes that are work, at work in nature. And again, this is emphasizing the observation of nature as the basis for one's artistic work. Um, we find echoes of this everywhere. We find echoes of this in, in Taoist thought in, the, in, in China, etc. One has to look at the natural world before commencing very carefully. There's nothing wrong with painting the world as a reflection of God's grandeur. Just as long as it is this world you are painting, that's, this is my extrapolation from Albertus Magnus, because it is this world and not another idealized place that God, however you choose to think of him, her, or it, uses to mirror that grandeur, to wink at the distractions devised by human agencies from the Roman Senate to Microsoft, is to divert us from, real, from the real to not something else, to close, our eyes, to close our eyes on the given world, what we call nature, is something close to blasphemy in that way of looking. However, the invocation of a kind of dura set of values is only half of what Marianne Moore is doing here. Notice how as she introduces the constellation of expectations around the artist's name, Moore also introduces the key question, though it is not phrased as an interrogation, that this poem will investigate, which is what reasons do we have to live in, quote, a place like this? What follows, as we have seen, is a panorama of a typical New England coastal town, whose only visible inhabitants are a student named Ambrose and a steeplejack named C.J. Poole. Clues abound throughout the poem that the speaker is as non-native as Ambrose's hat and books. This is a place that would not be dangerous ever, it seems, and therefore, by implication, is a little dull. Or is it? Going back, to, I want to go back, to, I'll have to skip a little, going back to the poem, I just want to pick out some key points in the poem that express a kind of worldview that Marianne Moore is, 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 is constantly engaged with in, until her much later work. Picking out this one wonderful phrase, it is a privilege to see so much confusion. And I, when I read that first, I was ab first filled with delight. I just wanted to jump up and down to hearing someone say this. But then I wanted to ask, why is it a privilege? I knew it was a privilege. I felt absolutely convinced that it was a privilege. But why is it a privilege to see so much confusion? Why? Seeing, for, for us, maybe we're not always conscious of it, or maybe we're not always thinking about it, but when we stop and think, seeing is a privilege in itself. Active looking um, is, an, is, an abil is the ability to discover order in the world around us. And surely the most satisfying, for me, the most satisfying thing is order. I don't mean simplistic order, but to see order, to find order, whether to, to, to impose it or to discover it is the question. But order is what satisfies me, and it seems to me that the, the great works of art, the one thing that they do is to, to exemplify a kind of natural order. Um, when we look at the world around us, when we look at places, when we look at landscapes, well, if you live in Britain anyway, you don't see wildness, mostly. Sorry, Julian. Mostly. You don't see wildness. You see human intervention almost everywhere. And worldwide, it's getting more and more like that until eventually there will be no place at all where you can go to, um, find, a, you know, to find somewhere that which hasn't been in, interfered with. As Wittgenstein said, you know, um, we had to move from Norway to um, rural Norway to Western Ireland because um, Connemara was the last pool of quiet in Europe. So what we mostly look at when we look at landscapes is a human-ordered space, a human-ordered place. But we also have the privilege of discovering the natural order and the, the organic elements of the landscape. <coughs> and it seems to me that to begin with, that's what she means by confusion. It could be profusion, and I think it's deliberate that she's chosen the word confusion to suggest that. Because immediately afterwards, she gives this list, this list of plants, this profusion of plants. And um, 
Mariam was, is, is, is very good at lists. Poets all want to make lists all the time. It's just such fun. But Moore does it so well, and um, it makes me think of, go it makes me want to go back to the original idea of the inventory. The, the inventory, which has its, its, its um, etymological roots in the same as invention, um, um, and maybe in musical terms of, the, of, of, say, Bach's inventions, where you find what's there and you make a list of it or you catalog it in some way, but by doing so, you're being inventive. You don't simply list what's there. You order the list. You make links or you imply links, and she does that all the way through this list. So she has the confusion and she has the profusion here. But the human mind makes order of all of this. And that's what we are constantly doing um, and by looking and seeing. And I have a, a huge passage from um, Arne and Ness on this whole subject now, but I won't read it out because I haven't got time. But um, if anyone has any references on that, just let me know. But we go on from this profusion, confusion, we go on to the idea of liking an elegance of which the source is not bravado. And that's key, that's a very Presbyterian idea, if you like. The elegance doesn't come from you know, this kind of flour flourish and flair. It comes from a modest discovery or inquiry or interrogation of the natural world around us. And elegance comes from order, the ordering process. It's interesting that Ambrose is, uh, um, I, I don't know why he's not native hat is, I assume it's a beret, but who knows. Um, but Ambrose is the man who, who conveys this. But we, again, we look at this, um, this example of the elegance in this um, slatted summer house, the, the, the building of the summer house, which echoes the natural environment around us. Now the question, I, I'll, I'm going to jump to this, um, the question of Safety at the end is interesting. It could not be dangerous to be living in a town like this. Um, I don't know, I, I don't read this as Marianne Moore making that as a statement. I think she's being ironic. Of course, it's dangerous to be anywhere. Um, but the question is, what is home? What the question she's raising at the end there is the idea of home. And is home dangerous to us? And I want to conclude my bit, but let's hope there's some time for discussion, by talking about this through, through the eyes of somebody else, a kind of tangential um, Yi Fu Dan, um, his book Space and Place, is, he's a um, human geographer, and I very much liked his discussion of the relationship between space and place and how we make home in space by, by making it place. And just to flag up what I really want to talk about at the end, which I haven't got time for, which I hope we'll get into, space is, is a real thing, and it's also a false thing once we get developers talking about it. People create from places spaces again. Places make spaces, we make spaces into places to make them into homes, and then developers and, and, and opportunists of various kinds, pioneers, so-called um, colonists, change places back into spaces again, so they become neutral and empty, and you can stamp whatever you like on that. And I think that's something I hope that these discussions will have during the next couple of days, will pick up on in terms of environmentalism anyway. This is, this, is, this is from this book, as I say, and I'll close with this, and hopefully we can discuss it. In experience, the meaning of space is often merged with that of place. Space is more abstract than place. What begins as undifferentiated space becomes place as we get to know it better and endow it with value. Architects talk about the spatial qualities of place. They can equally well speak of the locational by place qualities of space. The ideas space and place require each other for definition. From the security and stability of place, we are aware of the openness, freedom, and threat of space, and vice versa. Furthermore, if we think of space as that which allows movement, then place is pause, 
Each pause in movement makes it possible for location to be transformed into place. And he goes on later to say, professional planners with their urgent need to act move too quickly to models and inventories. The layman accepts too readily from charismatic planners and propagandists the environmental slogans he may have picked up through the media excuses gendered language. The rich experiential data on which these abstractions depend are easily forgotten. It is, it is possible to articulate subtle human experiences. And then he talks about the role of art, the artist in doing this. Going back to the poem finally, what I see Marianne Moore doing there is looking at a space, if you like, a panoramic view of an assemblage of human constructions and making of it an ordered unity which one can think of as home. The speaker of the poem doesn't think of it as home, but recognizes it as a place that is home, at least to Ambrose. Notice we don't see anybody else in the poem, so that's implied. But to, to maintain this place, this kind of looking has to happen all the time. And I would argue that uh, certainly now, at this point in history, one of the jobs of poets is to constantly look constantly to look at places, constantly to argue against the remaking of places as spaces um, and, and emphasize this idea of home, not only for ourselves, but also for others. I'll stop there and um, perhaps we can, we've got time for a few questions. John, thank you very much indeed. I was very interested in the whole notion of the list oh, and, yeah. and the poet's list and the idea of an inventory, which is also a discovery, so to speak. And it seems to me that a lot of very good poetry absolutely teeters on the edge of mere and then and then and then. <laughs> and the clever thing is what it does is it brings together that mere seriality into something that has a genuine organic unity. And I think that the way you've presented this poem illustrates that. But I, Perhaps you'd like to develop that a bit further. Yes, I've, I've always been um, perhaps weak in, in, in terms of the, the, the attraction of lists. Uh, Saliba Hill once said to me that the reason I wrote so many lists in my poems is because I, I used to work in computing, and I worked in um, my, my major programming language at one time would have been Lisp, Lisp which means Lisp processing, you probably know. Um, that's a long time ago. Um, and she, she, I mean, she didn't know anything about how Lisp works, but she thought, oh, Lisp processing, that's how he works, uh, and that's why he's, he does that job as well, um, just processing Lisp. But there is a sense of processing involved. It isn't simply passive to just accumulate a, a, a number of names and put them down in a list. We reorganize the names, we reorganize, and we may infer various kinds of structure there or relationships. Um, I've, I've been doing lots of arguing with people recently. I, I want to get Newton banned from um, any study of science and have him replaced by Goethe. <laughs> um, because Newton doesn't, doesn't care about the relationships between things. Yeah. Yeah. And Goethe does. Yeah. And um, Newton's done a lot, obviously Newton's a great mathematician, etc., etc. But Newton's done a lot of harm, um, to, especially to the life sciences. And there's um, Alan Moore has, has a wonderful essay about Newton, um, about Blake's um, you know, depiction of Newton in this cavern, I guess it is, uh, you know, the, 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 the Newton's sitting there, this, this kind of monstrous human being who's almost the same, he's the same color and texture as the stone around him. And he says the whole scene is unimpeded or unencumbered, I think it is, unencumbered by any sign of the organic. Mm. And of course, in general, confusion, di apparent disorder, comes into the world around us from the organic. Mm. Yeah. And, 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 and in our own lives, of course, um, you know, uh, illness is, is, is an organic aberration to us, but maybe not in natural terms. So lists are one way of coming to terms with um, the, the, the profusion, confusion, and seeming, sometimes seeming, but I don't think ever really, um, a hostility of the, of the organic world. It just keeps throwing stuff at us.
As a doctor, you'll know how people like to list their symptoms, yeah? <laughs> I couldn't Try possibly comment. Yeah. Sorry? <laughs> The last word of the poem. The last word in the poem. Um, oh, you mean just just that word, hope? Yeah, yeah hope. I think I have to extend that to being the star stands for hope. Yeah, right. but I, I just really wanted to hear what you what you thought about hope in relation to the whole poem. And indeed, your life. <laughs> <laughs> well, so far, I was just hoping to get through this talk in one piece. So <laughs> I've achieved that much, at least. I'm, I was still standing. Um, no, actually, I, I said to a friend the other day, um, not long ago, actually. Actually, it wasn't, it, was, it wasn't the other day. It was a while ago. It was when Donald Trump was elected. I said, hope is the new black. And that's, that was the best I could come up with. Um, I think, I think um, Marianne Norse has the best thing about Hope Ever, I suppose, um, in her poem, um, The Hero. Um, hope not being hope until all call, no, my memory's going. Hope not being hope until all cause for hope is gone. I, think it's that. I can't remember now exactly. Hope not being hope until the, the reason for hoping, any reason for hoping. It's like faith. Obviously, you can't have faith unless, and if you have proof, right? And if the world's being kind to you, you don't need hope. But it's interesting that this the undangerous place has to have a steeple and a star at the top of the steeple that stands for hope. Not for smugness or self-satisfaction, but hope. It's an interesting question because um, my sons are obsessed with some TV series which involves basically ritually sacrificing two people from a community to go on for something like that. It's bizarre. But I'm, oh, I said to them all, you know, this idea is really Shirley Jackson, the, the lottery. Um, not knowing anything about what they're watching on TV, of course, I haven't got time to sit down and watch it with them. But Shirley Jackson has this great story, the lottery, in which every year one family draws a short straw and the oldest female member of that family, interesting, it's female, female member of the family is then stolen to death in the public marketplace. And then the, that's a guarantee for the rest of the year that the community will live in this kind of peaceful, quiet life. Productive, happy, untroubled life. And is that too high, the question really is, is that too high a price to pay? Or would you live in a community like that? And in the, Amer in the America of the early 60s, I mean, uh, Shirley Jackson got hate mail and death threats for writing that story. Yeah. So um, the question of hope is, is, is immense. The most important thing, perhaps, is that if I have hope, um, and it's my hope, and it's not shared by other people in this room or people in, in South America, is it valid hope at all? Yeah, I mean, I go back to the old idea of the Bodhisattva in, in, in Buddhism, where it's a, somebody attains enlightenment and... and, and becomes liberated, but they don't pass into the next stage. They come back and are reborn constantly until, in the hopes of achieving enlightenment and liberation for all sentient beings is the usual term. And I think it's quite difficult to hope um, on, 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 on an individual basis if others are, others are living without hope, if you see what I mean. So this question of what is hope and what is home it's there at the end of the poem, and I think it's implied that, that, that it's much more tricky and thorny than she's presenting it as. I hope so, because then it's less of a poem if it's not. Yeah? You got, maybe you've got some other views on it. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. You said that um, this natural confusion <clears throat> can mainly be found in the organic elements in our cultivated landscapes. And I wonder whether you shouldn't highlight more the atmospheric conditions, the waves, the sea, the clouds, the rain, <coughs> the sun going up, the moon, and all that. Isn't that very important when we talk about landscapes? Because you could have plants, organic growth in gardens, or even a bonsai, you see? 
Yeah, yeah, I understand that. I, I think I may, probably misused organic. I pro, I, <laughs> there's this been this problem about using the word nature, certainly in English, for 50 years now, I guess. Um, we, we say nature. If I said, said nature instead of organic, that's probably what I meant. In the natural world, in other words, you know, the sea. And of course, the other thing about this, this place is it lives, this place is right next to the ocean. So nothing, if anybody's ever lived right next to the ocean, you know, it's never safe to be living in the town next to the ocean. Every 50 years or so, it'll take everything away from you. I'm, I used to live in this fishing village in, in Fife, and we had wonderful stories, or horrible stories, from the older people from the fishing days. But our whole family disappeared because they all worked in the same boat. So the sea, sea will take that from you. The sun will, the earth will, the play last night, you know. Um, it seemed to be an earthquake under that lying all. So I guess I meant nature um, in that. But the word nature in English is just such a dangerous term. People go off in all different directions. I mean, when one hopes to communicate something, one doesn't want to use a word which will send everyone in the room in a different direction. But yeah. Of course, and, and of course, the finer points of the atmosphere are, are what we're most worried about now. You know, not the, the very nuanced elements of atmosphere, like, you know, the balance of the gases in the atmosphere. Um, those kinds of things. Those are the th <laughs> people. Are, people are always talking about what's urgent, what really matters now, because we can see certain things which are urgent. We have a maniac in the White House, and he may press the wrong button one of these days, thinking he's ordering a pizza. And obviously that's very urgent. And of course, constantly we're forgetting the things that are happening, as it were, invisibly, in the background to us, and we'll accumulate one day until, bam. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm, I don't just mean plants, I mean all, all of, I think of, I'm a bit of an animist, you see, I'm Scottish, and we could never really got rid of our pagan roots. And I tend to think of thunder and lightning, and and the sun and the moon and things as actual organic creatures, as it were. <laughs> but yeah, I take, totally take the point. Yeah. Thank you so much, John. Right. Thank you.